The Secrets of the Great Pyramid. Birth of the Pyramid. Part 3. A 1970s fad invested the pyramid shape with magical properties. Place a dull razor blade inside a cardboard pyramid and it will sharpen. Put meat inside your mini pyramid and it will be preserved. Some pyramidiots even wore small pyramids on their heads to be energized. The movie Stargate uses the pyramid as a launch pad to the next world. The ancient Egyptians would have thought all this very funny. For them the pyramid shape had hardly any significance, certainly nothing magical. It was simply an architectural development, the same way our skyscrapers evolved out of smaller earlier buildings. For the Egyptians there was one and only one purpose for a pyramid to protect the body of the pharaoh. It was all about life after death. No civilization has ever devoted more of its resources and energy to preparing for immortality than the Egyptians. Much of what we know about life in ancient Egypt comes from studying their physical preparations for life in the next world. They were resurrectionists they believed they were going to get up and go again in the next world where the party would continue forever. Because the next world was going to be a continuation of this one, you would need pretty much the same stuff you had in this world clothing, food, furniture, even your dog. In 1906, the great Italian Egyptologist Ernesto Schiaparelli discovered the intact tomb of the architect Carr and his wife Merritt. There, neatly folded, were all the clothes the couple would need for their journey to the afterlife complete with patches sewn on by Carr's wife. In one corner of the tomb was the board game that Carr and Merritt played in the evenings, and with it the stools they sat on. Because Carr was an architect, he couldn't think of going to the next world without the cubit stick he used to measure his building projects. It's all there in the Egyptian Museum in Torino, Italy, packed by Carr and Merritt for the future, dot they were literally going to take it with them. But what good were all the clothes you had packed for eternity if you couldn't wear them? You needed your body. Enter mummification. As every sixth grader can tell you, skilled embalmers removed the brain through the nose with a long metal hook, the internal organs through a small abdominal incision, and then they dehydrated the body, so it was preserved and could reanimate in the next world. We know most of this by examining mummies found in tombs. Like pyramid builders, the embalmers never committed the details of their craft to papyrus. The embalmers weren't the only ones involved in the immortality business. There were miners to dig the salts used to dehydrate the bodies, tomb cutters, artists to decorate tomb walls, coffin makers, scribes to write books of the dead, and priests to recite the press and perform the rituals needed for resurrection. All this cost money, but the Egyptians had it. Egypt was primarily a nation of farmers living along the Nile, but there was also a large middle class that could afford preparations for the next life. Because Egypt had a strong central government, the pharaoh, there was organization and taxation. Farmers grew crops and an army of bureaucrats recorded information about the crops, collected taxes, oversaw shipments to government granaries, and made sure everything was running smoothly. Add to this the hierarchy of priests, high priests, temple overseers, and other religious professionals, and you have a large middle class, who can afford a nice tomb, to house the possessions, they are taking to the next world. Death was big business in ancient Egypt, and its biggest manifestation, is the Great Pyramid of Giza built for one, and only one, purpose to house the body of the dead king. The pharaoh, the living Horus, king of Upper and Lower Egypt, needed a tomb that would protect his mummy and all the goods he would take with him to the next world, and so the pyramid was created. But it didn't happen the way most people think it did a bright young architect, waking up one morning with the idea of building a pyramid. Rather, the pyramid shape was the result of hundreds of years of architectural development. It evolved, it wasn't invented. To understand the Great Pyramid, you have to understand the evolution that led up to it, and the beginning of that evolution is, surprisingly, in London. One of the British Museum's most popular attractions is a dead Egyptian, nicknamed Ginger because of his light-colored hair. Ginger died more than 5,000 years ago, 
centuries before embalming was invented and the first mummies were created, but still, he is well preserved. If you had known him when he was alive, you could still recognize him today after all those centuries. Ginger is a natural mummy, there. Result of his burial in the dry Egyptian sand. In prehistoric times bodies like Ginger were buried in sand pits in the desert. The sand dehydrated the bodies quickly, before they could be attacked by bacteria, preserving them as well as most artificial mummies produced later in the embalmer's workshops. Ginger lies next to some of his possessions pots, a reed mat, a necklace suggesting that even as early as Ginger's time, there was a belief in the next world. Just a few centuries after Ginger's modest burial, the Egyptians would be building pyramids. But it was not a giant leap, not an all-at-once breakthrough, it was a step-by-step -step journey, from Ginger's burial to the Great Pyramid of Giza. The problem with being buried in a sand pit is that the bodies don't stay buried sand blows away, exposing the body to animals. Even today, if you walk off the tourist paths at Saqqara, ancient Egypt's largest cemetery, you will sometimes see human bones protruding from the sand. Consequently, the next advance in ancient Egyptian burial practices was to bury the dead not in sand, but in bedrock. Clear away the sand, cut a deep shaft into the bedrock, and dig a burial chamber beneath the ground. Once the body and all the grave goods were in the burial chamber, the shaft was filled in with rubble to protect the body and its possessions. Then, on top of the shaft, above ground, a chapel was erected where the family could visit the deceased, make offerings, and pay their respects. Because these chapels are rectangular, the modern Egyptians call them mastabas Arabic for bench. The 